Hey, good afternoon. This is uh, Friday. It's the first Friday in June, and Pastor Trent Bodecker and I are back. We're reading through the Bible. How are you doing today, Pastor? Doing well. How about yourself? Oh, good. It's been kind of a busy week. We uh, had some athletes down at the state track meet, uh, had mixed results, but, uh, but that's good. It was a, a good day, hot day. It's really hot here in Ohio where we're at right now, but we got a lot of things to cover, as always, and uh, we're going to be working through um, Ezra and Nehemiah today. And uh, if I could, open in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for uh, your word. And, and Father, we pray that you would help us to focus in today on what you have to uh, say through Pastor and I. And just guide our discussion today. We thank you that we're able to do this. And we pray... Uh, blessing upon our time together, as well as those who might be listening uh, to this at some point. So, Father, we give it over to you, and we pray this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. All right, Pastor, let's get right to it. Uh, as, as always, uh, we kind of have the format. I get uh, asked the questions, and uh, and Pastor has most of the answers, and I get to chime in once in a while. So, Pastor, I'm going to throw the first question out Uh Kind of just a general discussion of the characters, the main characters we have here, Ezra and Nehemiah, um, and Zerubbabel, is that right? Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, yeah. there you go. Um, and I, I'm sure he had a nickname if he has a name that long. Some Somebody call him Zeb or something, I don't know, maybe not. Um, but anyway, um I think uh, maybe talk about that, and then I've got a follow-up question here. So Okay, yeah. Yeah, in Ezra and Nehemiah, we're talking about the period of the return from exile. And so I did just a simple diagram here to give us, a, I guess, a better perspective of the time that we're, we're talking about here. There's some, there were three phases of the exile. Jerusalem was, was conquered in three phases in 606 and 597 and 586, and the people were carried away in three different settings. Uh, they return in three settings as well. And Zerubbabel would be the first governor, and he would return around 536 BC with about 50,000 people. That's recorded in Ezra 1 to 6, and the project was to build the temple. And then uh, Ezra, we read about in chapter 7 through 10, he was a scribe, a priest, and he returned in uh, 456 BC. It says 1,700 men. If you count the list, it doesn't say that. If you count all of the list, which I didn't do, but I trust the people who did that, uh, 1,700 men, that doesn't include women and children, so it was a much larger group than that. And then later, Nehemiah would be a governor in Judah. He was the cupbearer to the Persian king, so a person who was close to that Persian king. Uh, he returned in 444 BC. And it was just him and a couple of guys with him. And the project was to rebuild the walls of the city. Okay. Thanks for the chart. Appreciate that. And uh, all three of these would have been uh, Jewish exiles. Is that correct? That's right. Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, Ezra seems like he, he's an interesting character, uh, very learned in the in the book of the law and, and the ways of, of God. And... Um, and also a priest, so he uh, he has a lot of things to give. Here, here's my follow up question to this: uh, In Jeremiah chapter twenty five, verses eleven and twelve, we haven't got there yet, but this whole land it says, "This whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon for seventy years. Then, after seventy years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity." Uh, declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. Okay, so my question is, did do you think that these men that you just talked about knew that they were fulfilling prophecy? I think maybe a criticism here is that they're they're fulfilling this prophecy on their own, knowing the book of Jeremiah. Hmm. What do you so think? I think they're they're definitely aware of Jeremiah. The very first verse of Ezra says, in the first year of King Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. So, in other words, everything that happens is a fulfillment of prophecy. But I think if you look at these men and their return, you see their motivation. And there's a passage, I'm just going to give you the verse, I'm not going to read it, but um, 
I, I'm pretty sure I wrote it down here. Ezra, it's in chapter seven where it says that he set his heart to study, to practice, and to teach the law of the Lord. So that's his motive is here's the people and they need to relearn the ways of the Lord. So that's his motive. Uh, Nehemiah in uh, chapter two, verse three, I won't read it, but the king, he's sad. And the king says, why are you sad? This is the king of Persia. And he says, well, why, why wouldn't I be sad? My people are, are living in squalor. You know, the, the city has been burned. And, and so his heart is to rebuild. Yeah. Like, this shouldn't be. So yeah. I think that's their motive. God putting it on their hearts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in, in their minds and giving a heart for their people. Yeah. I agree. Thanks for that clarification. Number two. Uh, why did Ezra consider the intermarriage of Jews with the people who were living in around Jerusalem at the time of the exiles? Why did he consider that to be sinful? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's one of the things that got them into trouble in the first place, especially if we think about Solomon. And Solomon had all of those foreign wives. And it says, his the scripture says, his the foreign wives turned his heart away from God and he built idols to their to their religions and so that's what got them in trouble in the first place there was this prohibition against making covenants making <clears throat> treaties with these other peoples because they would lead them in idolatry. and in ezra 9 14 it, it he's grieving he's praying and shall we break your commandments and intermarry with the peoples who commit these abominations so yeah. this is about about marrying into pagan pagan people so i kind of Dragging it over into to modern day culture, you know, really, God seemed to speak to me through uh, this passage and and saying, you know, Jeff, what what do you what is it in your life that's keeping you from serving me wholeheartedly? And I think that that's the whole take. It wasn't this isn't interracial marriage has nothing to do with racism. It has to do with living a holy life and putting away those things or not encumbering those things, which draw us away from the worship of God. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, to me, that's what these pagan cultures were doing. It wasn't, it had nothing to do with their race. It had everything to do with their religious beliefs and pulling them away from God. Would you agree with that? Oh, yeah, def definitely. If if you marry a young lady, if you're a Jewish man returning from the exile and you want to rebuild your faith, but you marry a woman who worships Baal, she's going to turn your heart. Right. I mean, she, she's gonna, that's going to affect your, your focus. And Paul in the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians 6, says, don't be une unequally yoked with unbelievers and yeah and you're right so that could apply to marriage a young man who says oh i you know i want to marry that girl because she's pretty well yeah but does she love the lord does she know the lord yeah um but it, you're right it could also apply to other things that could take our heart away from god that we allow into our life yeah it, it wouldn't have to be marriage it could be a lot of things that that are in our lives and and in the in this uh topic of marriage it has nothing to do with interracial marriage it all has everything to do with the heart of the person that you're marrying that's right yeah and i think even in the, the lineage of christ we see people from like ruth the moabite who's a part of the lineage of christ and so that that shows us it's not about it's not about race it's right. about religion good point that that's something yeah good point all right Number three, um, let's talk a little bit about the antagonist. Uh, every good story, and, and not that this is a story, but but it's certainly told very well as an antagonist, and we have one here. His name is Sam Ballot. Uh, I think that's the way you would pronounce his name. How? But how is this? Uh, you know, maybe talk a little bit about Sam Ballot and how this is related to our lives in ministry today. Yes, yeah, Sanballat was an opponent. He was probably governor of Samaria. So when the people of Israel were or, and Judah were carried in, into captivity, other people came in and settled the land. And so then the Jews return. And so there's this, this um, rivalry. These, these people weren't happy that the Jews came back. And so uh, he did everything he could to prevent the rebuilding of the walls. And he threatened, he ridiculed, he mocked. He tried to discourage the people, and then he threatened violence, and they were going to attack. He even came up with this plot. He sent someone in to tell Nehemiah, oh, you better go hide in the temple. 
They were trying to get him to go into the temple courts where he wasn't supposed to be so they could accuse him. Uh, so he he was a guy who was trying to hinder and stop the work of God from being completed. Yeah. And so uh, in uh, Nehemiah chapter four, verse five, it says, uh, talks about Nehemiah says not, he asked God to not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out in your sight. Pastor, there's people who've done us wrong. Um, we got. Did you think God uh, held uh, Nehemiah to an account here of 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 a sinful practice of wishing ill will on uh, Sam Ballad, or, or what do you think about that? Yeah, one thing we could talk about with Nehemiah is, is all throughout the book, he's a man of prayer. He's constantly praying. He did. Yeah, it's a great. It's a great book on prayer, and I, I think we would call this the theologians would call this an imprecatory prayer. When we get to the Psalms, we'll see several of these, and we can wrestle these. This is mild compared to what we see in the <laughs> Psalms. And I, I guess some things that it, I've studied in precatory Psalms before, and, and some points to be made is, number one, this isn't just Nehemiah's enemy. This is an enemy of God. Uh, this is somebody who's opposing the work of God. And when he prays this, he's in a sense handing this over to God. Like he he's not taking his own revenge. He's giving it to God to judge. Now, he is inviting God to judge, but he's leaving it to God to judge. Um, and I think also, if we look at the whole book, this is not him being holier than thou. Uh, in his prayers, he's constantly affirming, hey, we don't deserve your mercy, God. We have You have not dealt with us as, as, as we deserve. You've shown us grace. So I, I think there's an understanding that he has been shown grace. So I guess I wouldn't see this as a sin. Now we say, well, well, shouldn't he have prayed for Sam Ballot's conversion? Maybe he did, and we just don't have that recorded. Yeah. Um, so I think we all pray these moments where we're angry and we pray, and then God directs us back to where where our heart needs to be. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it's a realistic prayer. I mean, it's a it it's real life, and that's what the Bible is so good at recording the good and the bad and the other things. Uh, you know, it's probably not. We probably don't want to go around wishing ill will on that, you know, for God to bring down judgment on our enemies. However, we have enemies today in our culture, and it's becoming they're becoming increasingly um, militant, I think, towards Christianity. And so we ask God to intervene in those situations. And I and I guess I don't see any, any problem with that. We would certainly ask, like you said, for their for them to be converted, but but certainly ask God not to allow them to subvert his work in our church or in our lives. And this this was uh, rebuilding the city of God, the Jerusalem. And so, yeah. I, just, I think it's, it's good. Well, sorry, yeah. go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, like, you're right. Like today, I think we can pray for God to deal with. You now, we, we read the newspaper and we see horrible, horrible things. And it would be okay for us to pray, God, hold that, hold that person, you know, hold that accountable. Don't forget that sin. Uh, but I don't think we ought to pray. Like if somebody takes your parking spot at work, <laughs> you shouldn't pray, Lord, cause him to have a flat tire and run out of gas. <laughs> that's not the right way to pray. That's petty. You know? that's, that's a good point. That's a good point. When they're undermining the work of the, of the church and uh, the ministry of God. All right. We're going to move on to our last question, our last topic here for uh, this time. And that is uh, uh, Ezra's reading of the book of the law. And it was just, it, that's a wonderful passage uh, as they read and they study. And um, I, I guess I wanted you to, I wanted your comment on how they approach this day. I mean, they, they started in the morning, they read, they didn't read until noon. It says they talked about, the priests were among the people and teaching them the, the law. So maybe talk about maybe how a pastor thinks about ministry in the church and, and teaching us. What do you think, Pastor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a great passage. And I think it shows us there's a thirst here at this point in time for God's word. And we have faithful teachers who are who are teaching God's word. And I, I think, you know, we ought to be doing that today, teaching 
preaching the word of God. I shouldn't get up and preach my own, like, hey, this is what I think today. I, we ought to preach the word of God because that's where the power is. But you're right. There were also the priests there who were explaining it to the people, who were helping them to understand. And so when we teach God's word, we need to be doing that as well. Make make Show people how this connects to our life because it does. And in the modern church, we have the pastor, and which would be an elder, uh, maybe a lead elder. Um, and uh, you may have some churches uh, may have um, assistant or associate pastors and their elders as well. But there are also elders in the church that uh, teach and preach, not yeah, teach and preach the word right along with you, whether that's Sunday school class uh reinforcing uh the teaching and making sure that we have uh sound doctrine in our churches so uh, yeah, the right. other there's, yeah there's a, a team effort that's what you're you're bringing out there's a team effort here right it's not yeah, there was not just Ezra up there but he's he has others who are coming alongside and helping him right and it doesn't seem to me that he preached there or taught on the word the whole time but there were priests among the crowd who were also teaching kind of, kind of small group ministry it's mm -hmm. what kind of appeared to me happening. And this actually this actually happened on the uh, first day of the month of Tishrei, um, which is, as you well know, the seventh month. Uh, and and uh, it would be uh, Yom Teruah uh, and or sometimes it's called Rosh Hashanah. Uh, but we better know it better as the Feast of Trumpets. And we've talked about this. If We're not going to go through all of those feasts again. If you want to, we have uh, we had a whole a night, uh, an evening, one, one podcast that we dedicated to the feasts, um, which is very good. But uh, here we have the, it was actually on the Feast of Trumpets, which is the first day. And then they and then went, of course, the, uh, in Tishri, they have the Feast of Trumpets on the 1st and then the, the Day of Atonement on the 10th. And then they go through a week-long celebration starting on the 15th um, day of that month, which is the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. Either one is a correct, uh, is, is correct way to say that. Um, I'm not sure why they they kind of skip over the atonement in this account. Uh, maybe that wasn't important. You could talk. A little, I know you you had a, a maybe an idea on that. Yeah, I appreciated your question because I think when we read through this chapter, if it's easy for us to kind of read through and just think, oh, this happens over a couple of days. But you brought out that there's several different feasts here that are that that unfold. And so this is unfolding over a couple of weeks. Oh, several weeks. Is that right? There's several yes. weeks here represented. Yeah. So it'd be easy for us just to breeze through that and not, not pay At attention. At least three weeks mm -hmm. of uh, celebration, uh, recounting, um, certainly uh, reflecting on what God had done, and then ending with the, the Feast of Tabernacles, which is a celebratory time. That's a celebratory season because that's Christ dwelling with the people or should say Yahweh, Jehovah dwelling with the people. We in Christianity see that at the God, the Son coming um, and dwelling with us. But, yeah, my thought on the on the Day of Atonement is um, that's, that's more of a somber day. Uh, that's a day of grieving for sin, and there's an offering that's given for sin. And so I think, I think Nehemiah is highlighting the joy of this occasion. This is a like you said, the day of celebration with trumpets and and tabernacles. And so I think maybe that's what he's highlighting yeah. here. And so maybe he just kind of by it's not that they didn't celebrate atonement, but maybe that's just not part of what he wants to to really focus on here. You know, the other thing that just a general comment as we uh close out here, um, Nehemiah chapter nine again recounts go uh the history of the Jewish people going all the way back to Abram. Uh, Abraham through Moses and the and a really quick synopsis of the kings and how they they strayed and and they came back and strayed and came back. It could it could relate to the judges. They didn't name any kings here, but they kind of recount the history and and you think about that 
I mean, we always have to, this has got to be at least the uh, oh, fifth, sixth, seventh time. And then we have, you know, we, we just went through, uh, you know, Samuel and you know, Kings and, and uh, Chronicles. And so they're constantly reflecting and looking back mm -hmm. and at what God has done, Yahweh has done for them. And I think that that's an important thing for us to do as well. Mm -hmm. It seems like every time they have this celebration, they always look back and they remind the people where we've been, and then they get that to where we're we're going and what Yahweh is going to do going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, God's been gracious, and I think that's that's part of this. They see God's graciousness, and they see the charge to stay faithful. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's a good place to end today. Uh, again, uh, if you're uh, if you're joining us for the first time, uh, we have several uh, videos. I think they're on number 18 as we're as a congregation reading through the Bible. And um, and if you want to go back and look at those, uh, they're online at YouTube. Uh, they're on our church website. They're also on my uh, uh, Rumble channel, which is uh, Isaiah 626. And uh, you can find all those videos there. Pastor, another good uh, session. I appreciate your time. And uh, would you close this in prayer today? Sure, thank you. Let's let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your faithfulness. As we look at these chapters, as Nehemiah looks back and Ezra, as they look back on the history, they they celebrate your faithfulness to them and your forgiveness and your patience and your graciousness, how you always keep your promises. And Lord, that's true for us today as well. You are gracious and patient and forgiving. And you always keep your promises to us. And so, Lord, help us to follow you, uh, to read, to dedicate our lives to you each day, to live for you as they were rededicating themselves to you. Uh, may we decide, Lord, that we want to follow you and not the ways of this world. We know there are enemies and, the, and there are those who would oppose your work. But, Lord, help us to focus on you and find strength in you to do your work. Now, Lord, we pray all of this in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Good. God bless. Uh, until next week. All right.